Good morning, everyone. So, um, first question, who's heard of the Quantel paint box? Uh, about four of you. Uh, and who's heard of it because uh, you read about it on here? <laughs> so the, the Quantel paint box is a really strange machine because it literally did change the world. And what you're looking at now here is Google, which Google has kind of got a, a similarity with the paint box that it affects everything what we do, but nobody ever sees the technology behind it. So the search engine, all your data, etc., is on that search engine. Nobody knows what that search engine looks like, how it works, who owns it, where it's based. And also, if I type in Quantel paint box, you will see that really not much comes up at all. And that's something really strange for something that changed the world. So I'm going to give you a brief introduction. And I think we should start by uh, mentioning that one of the founders of Quantel, I literally just got a message from his daughter, and it would have been his 78th birthday today. So uh, I'm really happy to say uh, that this is an amazing coincidence that we can uh, celebrate Richard's achievements on what would have been his birthday. So here's a video of, uh, from uh, the late 70s of Quantel, which you may see a difference here between Silicon Valley tech and English tech. So this is how English tech started. Newbury, Berkshire, November the 29th, last year. There's one chairman, the one employee arriving with his uh, Aston Martin. Four men have arranged a rendezvous in this canal side building. The result could bring prosperity or failure to their small company, jobs to their town, and perhaps an object lesson for British industry. Peter Michael is 40 years old, the chairman and one of the founders of Quantel. There's another person arriving by plane. The second man is Bob Graves, the company's co-founder and now at 45 in charge of marketing. Third, Here's the Martin tech guy Trump, who has to walk. The boffin. He's 41 and the company's technical director. Finally, the whiz kid, managing director of Quantel, Richard Taylor. Just 33, yet already the man responsible for the biggest gamble in the company's six-year history. Happy birthday. Okay, so it's, if we call that one X and we call that one Y and we call that one Z, we are saying, saying X times Z. The meeting last November was to decide on a new product range. Tonight's programme is the story of this small company's attempt to take on the biggest and best electronics companies in the world. So as you can see from that, that's very much like Elon Musk's meeting when he took over Twitter. <laughs> it's so interesting to see these like literally boffins and the tweed, etc. that was uh, in Newbury and Berkshire and literally they, they, they'd come up with this tech that they became famous for where they, they had a frame store which in video they could combine two live videos at the same time without the the uh, waveform of the video camera uh, clashing. So it sounds like a very simple thing, but actually it was a giant leap forward. And from being able to have two frames at the same time, what they worked out also was that you could then do uh, graphics and painting, etc., on that top frame. And they developed the paint box literally from that, uh, from that basis. So i put together this little short video because most of you don't know what the paint box did or it's, this isn't a technical talk, but this gives you a, a, a view into where it started and, and all the things that perhaps you had no idea that were done on the paint box. Oh yeah, so it's not this paint box, obviously. Short moving sequence. A chart like this uses about 80 meters of black rubber magnetic tape and takes the weatherman about 45 minutes to prepare. On a bad day when everything goes wrong, it has been known for the symbols to fall off and a sunny period with showers can drop away into the unknown. In her plans for the new graphics, Liz had to work out how the weatherman would fit in. 
The space at the side of the box leaves room for Bill and his colleagues to get in the picture. Is it felt to be important to keep the weatherman very much in the picture in the future? Yes, I've got a picture here of Bill Giles. So he can, <laughs> That's amazing. He can either stand, stand here, or if there's some interesting information coming on here, right. he can stand the other side, which I can show you. For Liz, designing with the electronic paint box makes anything possible. So it went from this to the first customer for the paint box, which is actually the Weather Channel. This is BBC One. And this is how we create a picture of our symbol. But if during the new year we happen to want to change our symbol, then of course we'd have to build a new model, like this uh, stupid square world. But there's now a better way of trying out new designs. We always take the signal, convert it into a uh, digital form, the language that computers understand, and then we use computers to uh, play with the numbers and uh, then reproduce them uh, as conventional video. However, having said that, the, uh, the real art in the game is then to hide the computer so that the operator doesn't even know that that's involved have in their origin. As a company, we're very frightened of the word computer graphics because it's become a buzzword. Um, at the same time, it uh, frightens people uh, because they think they're going to need a PhD in computer science to be able to operate the machines. And indeed, in some cases, that, that is true. Um, it's surprising to say that as much work goes into the control mechanisms of our machines as goes into basically manipulating the video itself and we always go to great lengths to make certain that um, the person involved needs to know nothing needs to know nothing about the computer that's in the machine and indeed in our painting system um, although uh, a very exotic computer does the work uh, it's designed to be used by graphics designers and artists who have never ever been anywhere near a computer yeah one of the great pluses of the paint box is, is the speed so one thing that um, Quantel always used to say was to become a paint box artist took three years and one day. And it was three years at art college and one day at Quantel. And in fact, being in the 80s, that one day was actually half a day because they said we'd go to the pub at lunchtime and never come back. <laughs> so as he said there, the idea was that you had no idea the computer was there. There was no, if you want to play on the paint box later, you don't need to use a keyboard. It's all done with a pen. There is a, a, a mouse that they, they call a rat. But you don't need to use any of that. You don't need to know any programming, which seems all intuitive now, but in those days was incredible. And this is Martin Holbrook's work. So Martin was brought in uh, Quantel always involved artists in the development. Uh, the guy who designed the user interface, which were, worked for 15 years and was really, really amazing, uh, he was a technical illustrator and basically developed the user interface and demonstrated it, etc., and uh, just had a significant impact on the company. But they would always speak to users that in the uh, tech department and asked if there was any issues that were coming up on the paint box, but also the end user, they would ask the artist, hey, what could we change that's gonna make this a better product? So artists were always a really important thing in Quantel. Which you can work. This particular illustration was executed in a matter of 20 or 25 minutes from scratch without reference. I think it'd be very hard put to do that by more traditional methods. The stylus itself or the surface you're, you're working on is pressure sensitive, so with more weight on it, you can get a whole variety of different kinds of, of marks that are sensitive to however anybody uses it. And I think that's probably the most exciting. What using this praise? So that's the other thing that, that Quantel worked out. So Quantel had like various things that really were game changers. It only seemed tiny details. One of those was it had the patent, came up with the idea. Um, so they worked with Wacom and Summer Graphics and the original pen, the stylus, wasn't pressure sensitive. So obviously if you're doing things like painting, airbrushing, graphics, graduated lines, you needed that. So just coming up with the sensitive uh, touch that 
designers and artists needed really did change what, how usable the paint box was. This makes almost too easy is the speed with which you can change from one idea to another and obliterate something and then bring it back. So you've got the mixing palette below there. So the other thing is, I should say, would hear one how, how it changed the world. So if you see those colors on the palette, what you tend to see is all those colors in the 80s will appear in graphics because they were the standard palette colors. You use the white area to mix whatever you wanted to, to put together. But you'll really see those colors define the 80s because they were there. And the, you'll see, the, the artist talks about, you see this color, this pure pigment that's coming from glass, you know, from a CRT that you just never saw before. So David Hockney called it uh, the equivalent of a stained glass window. Uh, you're painting with stained glass. But here one can see particularly well the extraordinary luminosity of the, of the color. Which so you I go from those weather map muted tones there. to this, you can imagine. Well, I'm just uh, trying out this machine here. Um, that little cross uh, represents uh, the point. I'm actually drawing on a, uh, just a blank board and it leaves no marks behind. So what you're actually seeing is the original. There's no uh, piece of paper left. You're not drawing on a piece of paper. You're drawing, uh, uh, you're drawing actually directly onto this TV screen where you're seeing it now, in a way. This paint box. So that's the other thing that Obviously, there's lots of discussions that you see about NFTs, for instance. And please all groan at the same time about NFTs and the metaverse, etc. Now, one of the key arguments against NFTs and selling them is that they don't really exist. And all those discussions, those philosophical, technical discussions came about during this period of the paint box. So there's literally somebody who is talking about the paint box <coughs> in France, and they said... Okay, who owns the image? Who owns the image that you create on a paint box? Because you, you can't ever take it from the paint box. You can't take it from the computer. You'll see the effects of it. So you'll see it on a screen, but that's already an output. And if you output it to a film or a print, that's an output. It's not the original thing that you create. And as David Hockney said, you look down and there's nothing there. I, when I was working on the paint box, my advantage was I couldn't draw. So I'd never learned to look down at where I was holding the pencil and drawing an apple, because you look in a different place than you draw, which is totally alien, really. We're all used to it now. But all these things all started back then. And somebody made a really good point, I thought, that they said the computer owns the image. Because even if it's a floppy disk and it's the original data, it's the computer that always owns the image because you get to just see it and borrow it. But the computer owns it. So all these, you know, again, discussions, you know, how it affects now, all these philosophical discussions were all happening in the 80s, really. It, it falls probably into the category of variety is, uh, you know, the spice of life. It kind of resembles what I do all the time, but it's far enough away to give me a kind of uh, zestful feeling, a kind of a thrill. So this was done on the paint box. This was done on the paint box. Obviously, you all know that's done on a paint box. Oh! <laughs> so that was kind of a brief overview of kind of what the paint box was about. And obviously, I'd, I thought I'd end on this last slide, which is really the main use for the paint box, as glamorous as it did, it, all these videos, pop videos, etc., it created was as a business machine. So there's a great article, you can look it up in the New York Times and it talks about uh, the Olympic graphics. So it has ABC, NBC, all the heads. 
and uh, I think it's the head of ABC, and uh, he mentions that the thing with the uh, paint box was you could communicate better because you had better graphics. So you could communicate to the viewer in a better way, uh, news and information, etc., with better graphics. Um, the other thing is, they were happy, it's a really unusual piece of tech, because the bosses were happy because all these viewers suddenly saw all these really nice graphics, and if you look at the difference between the 1980 Olympic graphics and the, the ones done on the paint box afterwards, I mean, there's just a vast difference. So you're gonna get viewers attracted to your channel, so that means that your viewership goes up, which means that you're gonna sell more advertising and make more money from the advertising. So the bosses are really happy. The other thing is something that would take two weeks, like you saw with the hand animation, um, that would literally take you know, half a day. So your throughput was faster. The other thing was that the, uh, the so this, the first ever fake news, so the horrible thing about fake news is that obviously once you can manipulate things digitally as we know now, and everyone goes, oh, look at uh, you know, these AI programs, and oh, I can just say I want to put Obama's head on Trump's body, and I say it, and it does it. Now, the thing is, this did the same. Before electronic manipulation of images, if you wanted to put one head on the other, you'd have to go in the lab and cut it out and airbrush it by hand and all this, duplicate it, etc. So the paint box made that easy to just cut that thing out and move it around. So it kind of invented a really easy way to do fake news. I mean, fake news has been around for ages and digital manipulation. Um, and it has all those great benefits, but obviously it has kind of, you know, the bad benefits, uh, the bad parts to it as well. But in terms of uh, graphic design, the, uh, the, well, the first purchaser of the paint box uh, was the Weather Channel. Uh, it was demonstrated, the paint box, at NAB, which is the broadcasting trade show in Las Vegas. And uh, basically, uh, Martin Holbrook demonstrated it by putting one of the, the casinos on fire, which it seems like a trend to do this, uh, because there's a guy called Michael Katz, who was a graphic designer at, um, at um, NBC. They were one of the early buyers in 1981. And... Um, so he told me he was uh, kind of playing around and he drew a match and he was like, wow, this looks great, it's so realistic. And he thought, oh, I'll do, just draw some flames and some smoke. And the other thing is, I mean, it's not technically a GIF, but the, oh, where is it? Oh. So the, the paint box could also save little frames. So you could get a face, and retouch the different mouths to the face, and stack them together. This is 1984. This is Chiara Bori. The third one will do a boucle. It will be a movement in boucle. So you could do that and get him to start talking. He will tell you, but our dependence on the image is enormous. Voilà. Now I understand that isn't a GIF, but it's kind of like a similar principle to a GIF to get that. Um, and that was 1981, you could do that digitally. So again, it's not necessarily directly, but it's definitely philosophically and close to all these things that we're just used to now. So, so Michael drew this flame and he thought, oh, this is kind of cool. Right, and, oh, there's a feed coming in and it was January. 1982, there's a feed coming in of the uh, Orange Bowl. So he thought, oh, I'll get the stadium and see what it'll look like on fire. <laughs> so he put this burning flame on, on fire and literally the director's box straight away said, Michael, Michael, hey, where do you get that feed? The, the, the stadium's on fire. And he said, no, 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 it's fine. It's just a paint box. Said, what do you mean the paint box? We, we, we can see it. It's on fire. Like, so... They came down and they couldn't believe what he just did in like half an hour just playing around. The next day, apparently all the NBC executives all came down, saw the paint box and they said, right, we have to, no, no personal playing around on this. You can't do any, any, anything that could ever possibly go. You've got to do your work, your graphics and that's it. 
Now that is the first ever digital fake news. It didn't go out, but that's the first ever digital fake news that was done on a paint box that we know of. And so all of these things, as I say, this is how it changed the world because it did influence all these things and make all these things possible. So what do you need to know about the paint box? Well, um, obviously it was a massive leap because of the technology. I'm not a tech guy, but basically it worked with a small hard drive and the hard drive really worked with the interface with the user and all the number crunching and moving all the uh, images around was all done with uh, uh, basically as a giant graphics accelerator. So that's why my paint box, which is, uh, I know, is hopefully the 8-bit guy isn't in here. The, one, of the, one, of the, one of the annoying things about NFTs and gaming and all the rest of it is everyone thinks that the, the 80s is an 8-bit decade when this was 24-bit, real color, uh, sorry, full color, real time, broadcast quality. And for instance, my paint box is a 180 megabyte hard drive to do all that, which is crazy. So the technology, what they did is Quantel, they predate Apple, but they had a closed system. So Paul Keller, obviously one of the famous uh, guys, the, the technical guys who actually came up with the paint box idea, they wanted to build the machine that worked specifically for the software. So like Apple, we had this closed system where it was the software and the hardware. The paint box was also a quarter of a million dollars. Um, so you never got to see one, a bit like Google's search engine, because it was in NBC studios, post-production houses that did uh, all the TV commercials and pop videos. They all sprang up because you could make money out of uh, 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 doing all these effects for people. So. It was, a, it was an amazing leap, but obviously people know there was an AVA system, there was all these different things, Alvy Ray Smith was working on different things, but they didn't have the user interface. You know, you might have to program things or whatever. As I say, you could just pick up this pen, and Martin Holbrook said, you know, people say, well, why don't you use a mouse? And he said, why would you push a bar of soap around all day? You know, it's, it's just, you, Everything on the menu said painting, wash, try it, do it, etc. A guy who's a, a VR designer came and worked on a paint box. And it literally took him five minutes to, to know how to work it. And, and he said, oh, it's really amazing. The, uh, the user interface is just like everything that you see in beta software before they design all the funky buttons. Because it's just simple. Like, it just says what it does, you know, painting or chalk or whatever. So... They had three things that were going for them. Obviously, this amazing software, the hardware, but also the fact that they incorporated and understood that this was going to be used by graphic designers and artists. So they incorporated those people into the product at every stage. One of the amazing things that they had, which was uh, really, everything was about speed. So you could swipe on and swipe off to get all the menus on, as I say, you didn't need to click any buttons. Uh, you could change values just by swiping. So everything was, if you see a, a paint box operator at the time, they're really amazing speed. Now one thing it didn't have, uh, much to the chagrin of many operators, was it didn't have an undo button. Uh, there was two layers, there was old picture, new picture, so you could stay, save stages on the screen, but also in the library as well. Uh, but it didn't have an undo button, famously. And uh, Paul Keller was often asked, why don't you have an undo button? And uh, the answer was, we get our software and hardware correct. You should get your artwork correct. <laughs> now, that might sound a bit strange. And it was over 10 years before they put any kind of undo button on it at all. But the fact is, we're all spoiled now by choice. So if you're, a, if you're in a TV studio, if you've ever seen a TV studio and you hear the director and he's like, okay, yeah, we've got this, we want that graphic, get me the blue graphic, we want that, we want this other bar chart, whatever, can you make it bigger, all these things, you've got to do it in an instant. So if you've got an undo button, oh yeah, well I'll do this and oh, I might do that other option, whatever, you actually have to focus and go, no, no, this is it, this is how it's going to end up, this is how I'm going to do it. The other thing is that the paint box had like a training tape, but there were maybe 10 ways if you wanted to create a cube or a sphere that you know, moved around, 
there were 10 ways of doing that that maybe even suited your personality that you think, oh, well, I'll cut it out this way and I'd rather cut it out by hand than using a, a circular uh, mask tool. Um, and as I say, all the words were familiar. It was painting, the, the mask was red because in England there was a thing called ruby lith, which was your red masking material that you would have in a, in a photo lab and a dark room. So everything was familiar. Um, so, so yeah, we, we kind of like are spoiled by choice now, but it's, the paint box really taught you how to just be a good artist. And the other thing is, people say to me, well, you can do all this on the phone now. And I say, well, the thing with the paint box is, uh, it doesn't try and sell me any advertising while I'm working on it. And it doesn't collect any of my data. Because people go, hey, you know, I, I want to do an NFT off the, off the paint box. Could I do a JPEG? And I go, well, you know, the JPEG wasn't around yet. <laughs> it doesn't do a JPEG. So to me, it's, it's kind of funny that you've got all these things that uh, are around now, which really started in the paint box. And so what happened was, uh, Quantel really dominated the industry. This was such a revolutionary product. Uh, it, it sold all over the world, not in high volume because it was a, a niche item, but if you went to India, any place in the world, South Africa, Caracas, wherever, everything that you would see suddenly transformed on your TV at home, and you've got to remember, people would sit and watch TV for five hours. They'd watch the nightly news, the weather, all these idents, the titles. So what the paint box did was, as April Greenman said, it kind of like, it prepared us for this kind of Photoshop era. It was all, you know, it was before, you know, Mac being any good. So, and certainly 10 years, uh, nine years before Photoshop came out. So for those nine years, we kind of got used to watching a screen where we knew that the weatherman wasn't stood in front of anything. We knew that that kind of box moving around didn't actually exist. So when the internet came and we saw, if we go on to here. Oh. So that's a website, right? Well, where is that website? There's not a room full of websites right, that you know, you're looking at. That doesn't exist. You know, the, again, it's just your screen that shows these pixels. So. You had to get used to that. If that arrived just from nowhere, you'd be like, well, I don't understand, and why isn't the, this there? And, you know, so, so the paint box really was, I know it's not an appropriate term necessarily, but it was kind of like the training bra for the digital age because it got us used to what Photoshop did. It got us used to being cautious. When paint box came out and you saw an effect, you went, wow, that's real. There was a guy at Quantel, he did famously uh, a commercial... Um, for uh, uh, anchor butter and they had these cows that started dancing it wasn't on the paint box it was on a, a different system for Quantel and the guy at Quantel his mum rang, rang him up and said I've just seen these dancing cows on the TV they're amazing <laughs> and he had to say mum that's uh, done on a Quantel like they don't actually exist <laughs> so we all got used to that the other thing that we got used to was when you see all these logos and graphics, um, if you imagine, we all now know something about wallpaper and uh, colors and interior design because of all these makeover shows and you know, interior design shows on TV. And graphics and branding and logos and design, nobody was interested in whether something was Helvetica or Futura, and nobody just in general could see the difference between good and bad design. So if your grandmother now is sat on her iPad and she's going through Amazon and looking at different products and goes, oh, that company, that looks like a nice company. I like their logo. Well, that visual language came about because the paint box put all those graphics into everyone's living room for 10 years before the internet even arrived. So that's the other thing. It kind of really did give us this visual awareness that we never had before uh, the arrival of uh, digital graphics. Um, and as I say, it was, it was all around the world, um, wherever you went, I mean, obviously not you know, China, Cuba, places like that, but anywhere where they had like commercial studios, uh, this would appear on your local TV. Um, 
1986, um, Quantel introduced the, what they call the graphic paint box, which is the photo quality version of the paint box, which again, kind of revolutionized the other thing called uh, pre-press, it was called, where you had scanners, etc. So they took the exact same user interface and it was real time, etc., like you saw on the Queen video, where you could just cut it all out. And so they revolutionized that side of the business as well. Um, what happened in, uh, so, so everyone thinks that Quantel was destroyed by Adobe. And it, it, you know, if they know anything about Quantel, and it's kind of an easy way to say, okay, Adobe took over from Quantel and uh, PCs and Macs arrived, etc., and that's how it all kind of came apart. Firstly, I'd like to say that the, the paint box was an amazing machine that really dominated an industry for about 15 years. And if you imagine uh, an Atari home computer video game, how long that lasted, that didn't last 15 years. If you look at the, the Razer phone, that didn't last 15 years, or even probably Nokia, who, you know, these companies, Tech companies generally don't last very long because something else comes along, the market changes, etc. So there were various reasons why Quantel kind of faded away. Um, so Quantel patented lots of different things. Uh, they had like literally hundreds of patents, um, but they rarely sued people. Um, I have actually this this software called uh, it's on a on a floppy called Quantum Paintbox. Uh, and obviously it was like a $20 software or whatever, and it's got a little note in it saying, oh, by the way, uh, for Quantum Paint Box version 1.0, please note that we've been informed that we can't use the word paint box because it's trademark of Quantel Limited. So please, whenever you read the brochure, whenever you see the word paint box, please read that as paint. <laughs> it's so quaint. <laughs> they didn't bother changing it, just like, please pretend that word doesn't exist. Um, now, in 1989, there were obviously all these different companies like Silicon Valley. What, another thing that's important to understand is Quantel was in Newbury in Berkshire. As you saw, there's this small town. Obviously, there's some links to aerospace and uh, uh, military and all those kind of you, you know, government things that you get in any tech company. But really, when you compare it to Silicon Valley where you've got this whole hotbed of people and staff moving around and ideas, you know, Quantel weren't sponsored by Xerox or anything. They didn't have any of that behind them. So, I mean, it's astounding that they even could do this and then break into the American market that had uh, Dubners and Ava machines and, and be, you know, taken on board by the American market. So, that's really amazing. And that's another reason why it's kind of been literally photoshopped out of history is because it wasn't part of that group. You know, they were almost kind of uh, seen as outsiders in a way. Um, so they sued a company called Spaceward for doing, you know, a similar paint boxy kind of clone in 1989. But they really weren't a litigious company at all, despite having all these patents. Uh, because basically they thought, and they actually did, just make the Rolls Royce of machines. You know, it still was hard to kind of compete with it for quality. Obviously, you could do a PC or a Mac version, uh, and people ask Paul Keller, you know, why don't you just sell software? You know, you go the Adobe route. And, uh, you know, he's walked around the factory and show people, look, we make something. We're, I'm not just going to send, send people a CD in a box. We have people here, talented, that have supported us. We're going to support them. And it was kind of like a, you know, a personal decision it seems like a personal decision anyway, rather than necessarily, a, you could look back and say, well, it wasn't a good commercial decision. But would you go to Rolls Royce and say, hey guys, you can make a mini, you could sell loads of them. You're not gonna do that, right? So I don't think it was necessarily an arrogance, it was just a pride that you were making the best possible product. And they did make changes and go to PC eventually and you know, tweak it around, but it was never as good and as slick one amazing thing was I, I posted this on an Eyes of a Generation uh, Facebook page, and there's literally over 3,000 likes, which is crazy, 500 reshares, all these people coming out of the woodwork saying, 
wow, I went on these, it, the, the way you could just swipe, the speed of it, the ease of use, I really miss it. It was so simple, it was a beautiful product. Now, would you get that from somebody saying about Photoshop 1.0? <laughs> I don't think so. so. So, yeah, what happened was that, you know, various factors, you know, came in and desktop publishing became a thing and the consumer side of it, obviously, Adobe... Um, uh, uh, enjoyed that that change, and in so Photoshop launched uh, 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 sorry Adobe launched Photoshop 1.0 as you know uh, 1990 four years after the graphic paint box came out, and I think Quantel basically they they had been taken over by another company who they were making lots of money so they you know were kind of necessarily not the best managers because more uh, of a cash cow kind of thing, and. Um, so in 97, they decided to sue Adobe. Um, as you see, a nice little, uh, you know, smallish company, international company with two jets and a helicopter, but taking on Adobe. Um, not necessarily the wisest move, uh, especially because you have to not sue them in the high court in London. Uh, you have to go to Delaware, which might slightly be friendly towards an American company compared to a British one. And uh, Apple, because they were friends of the Noel brothers, uh, gave them free, their top lawyers for free, because, of course, Apple had shares and uh, famously wanted to buy Adobe. So they basically just wanted to crush this, you know, how dare you sue us uh, company. And they sued them on four or five different patents that, unfortunately, the beauty of the Internet now is you could be in the patent office and you say, hey, somebody's just invented this, and you could search the whole world and find, hey, somebody actually did this uh, six months ago in a, you know, in a university somewhere. You couldn't really do that in those days. So they had some patents that, again, because the, the technology was kind of a bit like when TV was invented, there was a, the, five different people totally not connected who came up with similar principles uh, and similar products. Quantel was, was definitely like that, where, where okay, you, you invented this... The, the famous one that where it fell down was they, they said, well, we've got the patent on the digital airbrush, which, again, with the sensitive pen, etc. cetera. And uh, in the court case, they proved that not only uh, was it done at N NYI, uh, New, New York Institute of Technology, um, which they could prove, there was also, because obviously Quantel would go around and look at different things and, and research and conferences, uh, they had a signature of uh, Quantel... Uh, staff in the visitors' book, <laughs> not the greatest, uh, you know, thing to to have to fight against in a court. But I mean, there's things that happen that, that, that you saw the clips from a famous series called Painting with Light with six famous artists on a on a paint box. Uh, a French TV um, a post production company did uh, exactly the thing: six artists on a on a computer in 1985. A year before Quantel did, uh, uh, the BBC did that. Nobody knew that they were doing that. Nobody saw French TV. It wasn't like now. So, so basically, uh, Quantel sued Adobe. And really, there's a good financial chance you're going to win. So it costs you £2 million in lawyers, but you're suing for £150 million. You know, that's, that's kind of a good payback. Unfortunately, you know, the staff get distracted by that. You know, you think, hey, you know, your development changes. Um, and yeah, so they lost that case. Um, one of the sad things is that during that case, uh, really, uh, the, the leaders of Quantel, Paul Keller, uh, especially, was, were kind of accused of, of stealing things and, and being this monopolistic uh, company that were trying to dominate the industry. And now, they did dominate the industry, be, be, but because they had the best product. Uh, and I don't think it was mentioned in the trial, but I think already Adobe had bought a company that was making a product, I can't remember the name of it, Coral or something, um, that was a competitor to Illustrator. And Adobe, as they are, bought the company that made this product, closed them down just to get rid of the competition, and the Federal Trade Commission had already given Adobe a fine and forced them to give the company back to the people that they bought it off as a punishment. So to have Adobe claim that, you know, Quantel were trying to take over the world, 
is kind of, you know, it's beyond ironic, and especially seeing how Adobe now are, uh, uh, you know, just turned into this giant monopolistic billionaire uh, company. Um, but it's obviously a romantic thing to say, well, you know, we fought Adobe and we lost, and so that's why uh, the company failed. And literally, uh, you know, the fact is most of you have never heard of the paint box because Photoshop became a name like Hoover, where it's just ubiquitous, it's a verb. But paint boxed was a verb before, uh, up until the mid-90s. People say, oh, it's been paint boxed, it's been paint boxed. Um, so it's kind of been photoshopped out of history. As you saw there, there's a, a museum curator. Uh, she'd never heard of the paint box. Nam Jung Paik, who's one of the most famous uh, video artists ever, uh, you can go on Nam Jung Paik's uh, South Korea Museum, and they have a picture that shows the paint box. Uh, it's David Bowie, and it has uh, the paint box uh, palette at the bottom of the image. And the curator has put, oh, and uh, this is a, a painting, and um, Paik stuck kind of a 16-bit thing to give it at the bottom to make it look like it was a digital image. So it's kind of crazy that nobody knows, even though the first ever music video, the cars you might think, uh, is in MoMA, uh, the first ever music video in MoMA, uh, that won the first ever MTV Awards, Dire Straits, Money for Nothing, won the MTV Music Awards in 1983. All these things that were done on the paint box that were all part of our lives, all those TV graphics, all that, NBC logo, etc., all changed, and nobody knows. Which is kind of like weird because, and I, I worked on one from 1985. I quit in 1990 um, because I was a photographer, uh, trained as a photographer. There was one at my college, and I had this choice. I remember this choice. Okay, I can either be a photographer, and I ended up shooting for a magazine that was all discos that opened. So you can imagine. I either sit in a dark room looking at a TV screen or I go traveling around discos and get paid to photograph discos at 25. There's not really you know, any choice as to what was going to be uh, the one I'd choose. Uh, but ironically now, as a photographer, I sit in front of Photoshop uh, as a traitor that I am. So I'm, I ended up being that person anyway. I can't escape it. Um, so, so yeah, uh, Quantel did survive uh, various takeovers. It ended up owned by Grass Valley. Um, the Weather Channel, who bought the first paint box, that, that DPB0001 was on display uh, at Quantel. And when Grass Valley uh, took it over, it ended up in Grass Valley's museum in California. So if you ever want to see the first ever one, it's, it's up there, it's a bit of a remote place. Um, but it just went into obscurity. Um, and I think, you know, it has various things against it. It has Adobe with their massive marketing, etc. By the way, I also want to say that if you go on Wikipedia and you look at the surviving members of Adobe or, uh, or uh, the Knoll brother, I think there's one Knoll brother still alive, you know, they list their hobbies as skiing and donating to museums and flying around to being billionaires or whatever, you know, that kind of lifestyle. And Paul Keller, if you want to, actually, let's do this now. So if you look at Paul Keller, who's the guy who said, uh, we're not going to sell software in a box. You think he's in Monaco? You think maybe he's on a yacht somewhere in Monaco? Um, So he, he spent his, oh, oh, no internet, look at that. Oh. So, Paul Keller, let me tell you, he spent his years of retirement uh, recreating a working model of Alan Turing's uh, Enigma cracking machine at the National Computing Center. So I think that kind of tells you, you know, somebody's passion and where it lies. Uh, he wasn't, I'm not going to say he's not a businessman because he had a fantastic business, but he loves tech for what it exactly is. And I think that's something to be applauded. Um, you know, in these days where, you know, again, we've, we've seen Elon Musk and how he's taken over Twitter and whatever you're trying to do and get rid of all these features just to make money. That really was never Quantel's. They charged a fortune and they do admit that sometimes they'll admit 
they'll come up with a new feature and just go, how much should we charge for this? But it's almost like, like they'd won the lottery. <laughs> like, like, we're doing so well, it's like, hey, it, you know, it's amazing. Like, like we, we, you know, we can just sell this stuff and it, it, you know, it changes everything. Um, so, so I think to look at Quantel and go, well, it was a failure. Firstly, it was the industry standard. Secondly, we all, whether we look at the Amazon, the internet, GIFs, all these different things now, it all has its roots in the paint box. All that visual language, all what we expect to see when we see computer graphics, what we don't want to see when we see Photoshop, etc. All of that really originated uh, with the Quantel paint box. And uh, to me, it's just, to, I, I actually ended up getting one. There's only, well, the great thing is as well, so two things from, for coming to this show. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, it's a fantastic experience. Uh, and thank you for welcoming me as somebody who uh, I'm so untech savvy. And obviously I'm from England, so I can't even say soldering properly. Um, we call it soldering, and in fact, if you say to somebody in England, I'm going soldering, they'd perhaps look at you like, really? <laughs> it sounds like something very suspicious. Um, so that tech side of it, and that's always been an issue as well, with, uh, which is in a wider sense. The tech people have always looked at creatives a bit suspiciously and said, hey, you don't know how this box works. So you don't really get the full experience of this software and hardware because you don't know the beauty and all the coding and the wiring and everything, which I do understand and appreciate. All that is creative and it's a, a beautiful thing that you do. But at the same time, like Martin said, the beauty of the paint box is that we, we want us, that you don't see that the computer's there. He said the most creative work and he said, it surprises us, because we just put it out there. We don't know what people are going to use it for. Uh, they gave three to art colleges, just basically so students could get access to this stuff. They had bursaries so they could um, uh, train, train people up and go out in the industry. But he said, uh, you know, the true creativity and the true skill of the paint box is that you create something that you don't realize it was done on a computer. And again, that's something that, you know, we're used to now, but you weren't used to in those days. So, so yeah, that's the paint box. Um, it's, it's weird, I've got one, I'm trying to you know, recreate how it used to be. As I say, thanks for inviting me here. The other thing I've got this is uh, how you used to input and output. I've got a thing called a film recorder where you would be able to get your, your image onto, uh, onto 35 mil film, um, which I I know it sounds strange, but film to me has a, uh, uh, sorry, digital has a, has a particular fingerprint. So the same way that somebody can look at some 8-bit thing from an Amiga or whatever and recognize it, the paint box. Um, one of the amazing things with uh, my whole quest and working on a documentary on the paint box, all these people coming out, everyone wants to help. I'm doing an exhibition at the Computer Arts Society uh, next month, which is founded in 1968. Uh, if you know the artist Keith Herring, I found some art from Keith Herring that he did in 1989. And I'm working with the Keith Herring Foundation and the person who videoed it. And we're taking the, the tape that we've got, the original high resolution tape, and I'm putting it back on the paint box to not only exactly match the color, but match all the kind of pixels, the way that the paint box kind of created these pixels. So to me, this kind of, I love the idea of this digital fingerprint. You know, if you've got an old painting and somebody restores it and cleans all the dirt off it and patches the holes, they don't use some, you know, house paint. They use the actual traditional paint that matches. And so I feel really pri privileged to do that. And posting just about this event, um, it, you know, 3,000 likes on the post, 500 shares already. So there's maybe about 50 Quantel products left at all. Um, the original uh, 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 DPB, it was called, the brown, big brown filing cabinet size one. Uh, there are uh, three of those known to exist. Only one works. A guy called Mark Nias in Manchester, uh, Dexter's Tech Lab, if you want to Google that. You guys love tech. You're going to love 
you're going to be like, okay, I'm glad Adrian was the gateway to this pleasure watching all this soldering and uh, fixing and programming, etc. So I definitely recommend, and he has a Discord as well, which is great. Um, but uh, yeah, there's maybe 50 of Quantel's, all the products they ever made left. And uh, coming here, because of that post, uh, I've now found two more edit boxes and a Harriet that people said, oh yeah, I've got that in my garage, I've not switched it on. Like, so, you know, this stuff is all being revealed. And so I think this, this idea that people go, I've got this art that I've saved, I've got this memory, I've got this, this uh, showreel, and I've got this tech. You know, it's been a fantastic thing that we, you know, we all come here because we have a passion uh, and want to preserve stuff. Uh, and I feel honored that, that I'm kind of some kind of conduit for, for, the, for bringing this all back to the fore and all this great stuff's coming out of the woodwork. So, so yeah, I've got four minutes left. Are there any questions? So I, uh, I, so I came across it at Blackpool College. So it was one of the, the paint boxes that they gave to the college. And um, so it was a big heralding of, oh, this paint box is arriving and what it could do. And then of course, it's 1985 and it arrived. And on my photography course, everyone wanted to shoot 10 by eight transparencies. It was like, oh, the bigger, the better resolution, the quality, everything. So of course this thing arrives, and they're like, what the hell is video quality? What are those 625 lines across it? You know, that's like worse than like, you know, a Polaroid had dropped on the floor. We don't want to touch that. Uh, whereas I was like, okay, but I want to get Trafalgar Square and put a pair of denim jeans on, you know, Nelson's column, and I can't do that in the lab. So, you know, I, I always have this thing. It's always about the idea. You know, the implementation is, is great if you get that aid but it's always the idea. So nobody ever goes, oh, I saw this uh, Picasso and it, you know, the resolution was terrible of the oil paint. You know, nobody remembers the frame around. If you remember a frame around a painting, it's a terrible painting. <laughs> so you know, people do get like, hung up on the details and the technical aspect, but if you look at you know, any meme that you see or anything. I did a meme in 1987, I put my head on Captain Kirk's uh, uh, body and hand colored the thing. You know, it's 1987, I had to post it because there was no internet. I don't know if it still qualifies as a meme. But when people saw that, they just liked it. They didn't go, oh, it's a little bit fuzzy and has some lines on it. Um, so I basically got to use the paint box myself because all the other photography students said it's crap quality. All the graphic design students said, oh, we don't want to touch that, it's going to put us out of work. There was a thing called technical illustration at the time. And so there's a big thing of like cutout engines. If you remember like, you know, manuals and, uh, you know, an aircraft, you show an aircraft with like bits of it missing to show where the exit signs were. It was like a big thing, you know, like a big business. So they all looked at it. It would like spend six months airbrushing something with actually a real airbrush. And they were like, no, 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 we don't, we don't want to even look at that. Uh, you know, which again, was like the kind of the beginnings of CAD as well, you know, CAD, CAD's a whole area that's even, you know, forgotten about uh, in the tech business as well. Um, so I, I just had free reign on it, just sat on it. Got a, actually, at the time, I was addicted to slot machines. And so it, I had the perfect personality. I couldn't draw, so I wasn't used to, you know, drawing properly. And uh, it was just like a slot machine. Uh, so you would, a bit like now, you'd get on something. It was so amazing to do it and go, whoa, all this. And you'd just be sat in front of this monitor in a dark room. And then after eight hours, you'd switch off and you'd just be like, <laughs> you know, your eyes would be flickering. But it was like suited my addictive personality at the time. It was just like a free slot machine. So Quantel invited me down, you know, like they did to a lot of artists, down to, to look at the graphic paint box and, you know, give my, you know, two pennies of thoughts on it, etc. Actually, my image was used on the front cover of the brochure. Um, and then I freelanced. So at the time, oh, I've got one minute left. So at the time, you could, I was paid $500 an hour as a freelance paint box operator. Because it was, that, that was in 1986. So it was a crazy way to make money. If you had a Quantel pen in Covent Garden, where all the post-production companies were, you didn't have a Mont Blanc or anything pen. If you had a Quantel pen, 
in your top pocket. Everyone was like, whoa. <laughs> He's going to be Hong Kong next or whatever. So, um, so yeah, I did that, but basically it was hard because I was literally kind of the first photographer to specialize in digital manipulation. So to go to every client and say, hey, I have this new thing, it's called the paint box. You know, imagine going in and say, hey, I've got this new thing called Photoshop. And they go, well, what can it do? And they go, oh, I can do this and this and this and this. And then they say, okay, how much would it cost? Oh, it'll cost you like $1,000 and it'd be crappy quality, but it'd be cool. And so they'd be like, okay, let's go do it. And then you try it. You know, in those days, like an art director told me, well, yeah, I remember like you just had some weird machine in an industrial unit somewhere and I drove an Alfa Romeo and had a cool suit and I thought I was like the business. And we told the client, oh, we're just gonna do something. And it was a thousand pounds and, you know, we just came up with something. Those are the days. Um, but you would go there and you'd do all this stuff and then they go, oh, mosaic. Can you mosaic it? That's cool. Like, yeah, let's just do that. So there was a, like that gimmick element in the, in the late 80s especially where, you know, we went to see a Terminator movie because it's like, oh, liquid metal. So there was all these different things. Um, but yeah, uh, and I don't know if I've got time, but yes. But I, so I work from the, from the uh, analog to the digital side. So the good thing is, instead of being able to do 3D, I would like reflect images in tin foil. Um, my most famous one was somebody asked me, they said, oh, we want to have this, uh, you do computers, right? Oh, oh yeah, yeah, I do computers. <laughs> so they said, oh, we want this like grid like Tron and this head will come out and like revolve and then go back down like in blue glowing grid. Can you do that? And I said, yeah, I can do that. And so I went to the pub with my friend who worked on, Chris, who worked on a Rostrum camera. And uh, they could do all sorts of different chrome and lettering and whatever, just with film techniques. So, oh, out of time. Oh, oh so, um, so he said, oh, yeah, I can work that out. So we went to a pub, got drunk, worked out to do it. The next day, we did it for in, in literally two hours. We got some fishnet stock in, uh, put it across a grid, got a white pottery head, shot it on lith film, and had it glowing, etc. And the client called me and he said, oh, when will that uh, computer graphics be ready? And I was like, oh, it'll take a couple of, couple of weeks to render that. So... <laughs> So that was the other good thing that I combined my knowledge of like traditional techniques with computers. But by 1990, as I say, other systems were coming. I'd rather be a photographer, so I literally just quit and everything just stayed. I've got all my archive, but it was just sat in my mum's attic for 30 years. Um, so, that's, so that's the history of the paint box. Um, hopefully you, you look into it and appreciate it and understand Adobe isn't the first by a long shot, by a decade pretty much. Uh, and all those things that you saw and the things that you look at now are really all linked to this amazing machine. Thank you.